This coach has performed all across Canada, was named Q107 second funniest person with a day job, and recently performed at the Boston Comedy Festival. Please welcome Dave Patterson. <laughs> Going over Mr. Dave Foley doing his corporate clean act for you. <laughs> I, uh, I just celebrated my third anniversary, which is awesome because I'm uh, I'm at that point in the relationship when I could finally let myself go. <laughs> huh? No more thinking about the gym for me. No, I'm just gonna sit in my basement, eat pizza, and watch Xbox. I'm not gonna play Xbox because that is just too much effort, you know. Met my wife, oh God, I'm so happy I did, because it's really hard for me to meet people, especially one-on-one, -on -one, but like, I tried everything to meet a woman, right? I tried like internet dating, had people set me up. It even got to the point where a buddy of mine was like, hey Dave, have you ever tried speed dating? And I was like, not intentionally. <laughs> sure that last date lasted less than five minutes, but it wasn't the lady ringing the bell, you know? It was a bartender coming by going, sir, I think your date left. Uh, getting engaged, that was a lot of fun. And the most intimidating part about that is you got to go buy the ring, right? And you got to spend like, what, three months' salary on a ring now? Ridiculous, three months. It wouldn't be so bad, though, if they would let me pick the months. Right? <laughs> well, I go like October 1998, <laughs> September 2004, last month. Here you go, sweetie, here's 87.50. Go buy yourself something sparkly. Oh man, but I walked into the store to buy those rings and they were showing me these rings that are like nineteen, twenty thousand dollars. Twenty it's, it's an engagement ring, it's not an engagement Hyundai. And if I'm spending that kind of money, damn it, I want a warranty. You are not getting that with a ring, you know? Planning the wedding, I was a hell of a lot more involved with that than I wanted to be. Oh man. We had to pick our wedding colors. Like what the hell, man? I'm wearing a black suit, she's wearing a white dress, that's all I really care about, right? About a month, or we pick our wedding color, she's like, would you be okay if we went with magenta and chartreuse? <laughs> I'm like, I'm a heterosexual guy, okay? I know six colors, those are not any of them, all right? Like, magenta sounds to me more like a fucking horrific disease. <laughs> it's in other news in Africa, 17 people died of the magenta this weekend. Like, what do I care, right? And it's like, well, about a month before the wedding, she comes up to me and she's like, would you be upset if we changed our wedding colors? I was like, we have wedding colors? It's like, yes, don't you remember? I said we were going to go with our, well, I said we were going to go with magenta and chartreuse. Like, those are your black, or those are your our wedding colors? I thought those were your black friends from work. In my defense, though, I grew up in Peterborough. <laughs> and there were only like three black people in the whole city, right? They just shipped them from school to school on picture day, right? Which, ex which explains why I had an 18-year-old dude in my grade three class, but you know. Peterborough's the kind of place where they consider a, consider a bagel to be ethnic food, right? It was not until I was 23 years old and I moved to Toronto that I realized that a Filipino was not a pepper that I put on my nachos. <laughs> a lot of really weird looks from my buddy though, eh? It's like, uh, hey Jimmy, those Filipinos were really spicy last night, eh? <laughs> You're an idiot. Oh man, but I gotta tell you, I am very excited to bring our first contestant to the, uh, to the stage. He is a, a, a very funny man. He is a CEO of West Court Capital Corporation. Not only am I this man's comedy coach, I'm also part of his research team. Yeah, you must have read some of my reports. <laughs> this, I, we're all here to support the kids. I am really here to support the kids because if it does not go well, I am fired. Right? It's, it's like I'm supposed to tell you what it was like working with him, and it's like, you know, working with him on the comedy side was really very similar to the way that I, it, it works when we do research, where it's like, I will look at all the facts, all the documentation, I will analyze it, offer him up my opinion, then he just does what the hell he wants anyway. Yeah. Anyway, I'm very excited to bring to the stage your first CEO of the night from West Court Capital. Please put your hands together for Mr. David Kaufman! <laughs>
Thank you. Let's hear it again for Dave Patterson. <laughs> yeah. Westcourt is not going to be the same without him. Yeah. You know, I just have to rewrite my entire routine backstage because Dave Foley stole all my jokes. You know, when I told people I was going to be doing this over the summer, you know, they all said the same thing. After telling me how crazy I was, the very first thing they would say is, aren't you nervous? And I'd be like, I'm not nervous. I'm Jewish. <laughs> all the best comics are Jewish. Don Rickles is Jewish. Jerry Seinfeld is Jewish. Bill Cosby is Jewish. <laughs> but the best thing about being Jewish tonight is I have a distinct advantage. No matter how badly I do tonight, I literally cannot fall flat on my face. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when I was in law school, there was this table in the foyer of the law library where all of the girls that weren't actually in law school uh, would come to study, but really, of course, they were coming to find, you know, boys that were at law school to date. We had a name for these girls. We called them snails, students not actually in law. <laughs> so I figure, you know, I'm a law student. They must be interested in me. And so I start patrolling that table. And one day I see this one beautiful snail and I kind of <laughs> swagger up to her and I introduce myself. And then I'm so surprised that she's actually willing to talk to me that when she introduces herself, I forget her name right away. But that's OK. I invite her out for dinner. So we head out to the restaurant. And as soon as we get there, the waiter arrives. And she starts listing off all of these food allergies, especially to nuts. So obviously, she ends up ordering a salad with the dressing on the side. Salad arrives. She starts to eat. I'm eating. Everything seems to be going fine. And then all of a sudden, she starts making this <coughs> sound. So, so I figure, OK, she's got Tourette's. <laughs> but she's hot. <laughs> so, so let's see where this goes. So in the next few minutes, things get a little worse. You know, she starts getting these hives on her neck. And she seems to be having trouble swallowing. And the <coughs> is getting noticeably worse. And then she turns to me. And she says, I think there's nuts in my salad. <laughs> so right away, I know there's three ways that this is going to turn out. Number one, there are not nuts in her salad. She's going to be fine. Number two, <laughs> there are nuts in her salad, but the allergy is not that bad. She's going to be fine. Number three, there are nuts in the salad. The allergy really is that bad, but she's got an EpiPen in her purse and she's going to be fine. Turns out, it was number three, except for the EpiPen. <laughs> she's not going to be fine. We're going to the hospital. So the first, you know, the first thing that occurs to me is, you know, I don't really know her that well. I should throw her in my car, race down to the emergency room, slow down to about 10 miles an hour, and push her out the passenger door like a gangland drive-by shooting victim and speed off. And then I'm thinking, wait a minute, if I do that, there's no date number two. So instead, I do the right thing. I call 911, the paramedics arrive, they throw in the back of the ambulance, and I climb in there with her. And on the way down to the hospital, I'm holding her hand, and I'm like, it's OK, you. <laughs> Everything is going to be just fine. So. So we arrive at the hospital, and this doctor comes rushing up to me, and he starts asking me these insanely difficult questions. What's her name? I don't know. How old is she? I don't know. Does she have any friends or family we can contact to get some information? I don't know. And then he looks at me all frustrated, and he says, is there anything about this girl you do know? Yes, I say. She doesn't go to law school. <laughs> so as amazing as it may seem, I did end up marrying a beautiful girl, Sarah, who's actually here tonight. Although I have the distinct impression that in about 90 seconds, she's going to wish she weren't. <laughs> 
We have two beautiful boys, Max, who's now four, and little Jakey, who's two and a half. So last year, Max is three. It's time to pick a junior kindergarten, a JK, right? And Sarah informs me that we have to start preparing for the interview for JK. And I'm like, let me get this straight. There's an interview for JK? I can go online right now, and I can get a hunting license <laughs> in four minutes by filling out a form. And there's no interview for that. But somehow I need an interview to be able to demonstrate that I can you know, play with blocks and go tell an adult when I pee my pants. <laughs> Moreover, she says, not only is there an interview, but she's worried that he's gonna have to know how to read. And I'm like, what do you mean know how to read? You, you shouldn't know, have to know how to read to get into JK. You go to JK to learn how to read. <laughs> but no, she's heard about all of these prodigy three-year-olds and they know how to read in two languages and she's got her knickers in a notch. She's, she's really worried about this. I say, honey, settle down. I'll take him to the interview. Everything's gonna be fine. <laughs> so the day of the interview arrives and I throw Max in the back seat and we drive to the school and we go up to the JK registration area out in front of the school and there's this massive table there full of name tags. And I walk up and this bubbly woman says hello and I say hello and then she kind of kneels down in front of Max and she says, hello, young man. Would you please you know, grab your name tag and put it on and go inside and join the other kids? Yeah. And I'm like, fuck! <laughs> <laughs> We've been here for 20 seconds and he's gonna fail out of JK before we even get inside the school because yeah. he doesn't know how to read. I'm already doing the mental math of what it's gonna cost to build the Kaufman wing. <laughs> So, I've never been a religious person, but I figure if I pray hard enough, maybe the hand of God will come down and help him pick the right name tag. So I start praying, and I'm staring at that Max name tag as hard as I can. I'm just staring at it, hoping it might just levitate enough for him to pick the right one. And it, it seems like 15 minutes that passes, and finally the moment of truth arrives. And he looks at her, she looks at him, he looks at me, I look at him. And then that little hand goes up there, grabs a name tag, peels off the sticker, puts it on his chest, and I look down at him and I say, okay, Ahmed, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, you've been great.